So it could be worse. I was in a course in my undergrad career where uh, everybody showed up to the final. Uh, the professor didn't. An hour later, uh, we get well, as half hour later, we get tired of waiting. Someone goes up to their office. They're in there. They forgot about the final. They come back a half an hour after that uh, with printouts with three questions on them. And this was like 25% of our grade. So I was like, okay, well, this is a really good way to run a final. All right, anyway. So we had just started talking about VAD, V-A-D, the nature of virality, the qualities of uh, images, messages uh, that cause us to want to retransmit them. Uh, VAD, valence, arousal, and dominance, where valence is whether or not an experience is positive or negative. Just because something is positive doesn't mean we're going to share it. Just because something is negative doesn't mean we won't. Uh, it's all about which direction the needle moves in. And it's the arousal and dominance that really determines whether or not it's worth sharing. So we, we will share things that, you know, that enrage us. <laughs> things that make us angry, things that make us disgusted. As a matter of fact, it makes up the majority of the content that you're likely to stumble across on the internet. Everyone's done the doom scrolling at 3 a.m. You know, going through whatever horrible things are happening. But that's valence. That's just the direction that the needle moves, plus or minus. Uh, arousal is the uh, intensity of those emotions. So anger tends to be a very spurring emotion. If we're angry, it tends to motivate us to action. Uh, sadness, not so much. Sadness tends to have the exact opposite reaction. Uh, when we get depressed, we, we tend to be less motivated to actually do things. You can have uh, positively valued, so positively valenced, high arousal things like excitement and awe and such. That's why the double rainbow from many, many years ago became viral, the awe, the excitement of it all. And then uh, there's dominance. And uh, dominance is the quality of feeling as if you have agency, uh, that your sharing of it is uh, likely to be well-received, um, that you're, you're giving them what do they call them again? Um, call to action, right? Um, you know, you can be angry. And if you're angry, it might motivate you to want to do something. Uh, and just in that moment, if we get some push in the right direction as to what we can do, uh, then it's all the easier for us to, to go ahead, you know? Like, subscribe, forward, upvote, downvote, whatever. As long as we have some kind of action and agency, you know, we're more likely to execute it. There are certain things, again, that uh, spur us more uh, than, than others in this regard, too. Like, for example, I mean, you, you've been told to like and subscribe or upvote or whatever, uh, like, favorite, share, whatever, probably thousands of times by just about everybody uh, that's trying to ride the algorithm to success. Uh, the question is, is what dominant factor actually causes you to do that sort of thing? Well, um, one of the things that we say, see all the time right now, as a matter of fact, because it's an election cycle, uh, is that a lot of ads will, will use fear, right? They'll say, go out and vote, because if you don't, vampire babies will be voted into office, and they will go around killing regular babies, creating more vampire babies, and then we're all dead. That's a, a fear tactic. While nobody wants to be uh, you know, alone against an onslaught of vampire babies, it's also much less likely to motivate us because it's fear. Fear is just causes us to have less agency. We tend to be paralyzed by fear. However, uh, if a message is being delivered by somebody we happen to admire, if we're watching content by somebody that we think, well, they seem like they have a good head on their shoulders, they seem to know what's, what's going on, well, that's a high dominance trait. And we're more likely to do something as a measure of appreciation or a way of engaging with them or what have you. <clears throat> and humor, uh, we talked about last time, uh, is obviously very viral, right? We like to laugh, everyone likes to laugh, which is why so much of the content we see in memes tends to be funny. Some humor does better in some aspects than others. We talked about the, we saw the Six Flags ad with the guy dancing. That's supposed to be using humor, I guess, of a fashion. Uh, and that plays better on TV. It's better not for the people watching it because everybody hated that goddamn commercial. Everybody hated that guy. Um, but it's better for the advertiser, right? Because it's less controversial. 
Whereas, I mean, come on, so much of the humor that we see in memes these days is that it's damn right, it's down depressing. Right? <laughs> it's it's all shit about how everything's going to hell in a handbasket, uh, and uh, and it's a joke, it's supposed to be. So dark humor, perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable. Most people engage with it just fine, but there is a time and a place, and it doesn't work well uh, in an Applebee's commercial. It just doesn't. When used in an ad, as we saw with that Rickenbach ad for glasses, um, it was definitely funnier than the dancing guy in the Six Flags, but it also didn't do very good for that brand because, well, oh, hey, I saw that commercial. You're the, uh, you're the dead old lady guys, right? Nobody has that kind of brand association. That's because Leisig's framework, we have competing interests here. These uh, uh, humor uh, being used for potentially viral content is meant to play on the motivating factors for the average person, uh, which are going to be things like not the law in this case, but social norms. Right? That's funny to be playing around with those kinds of things. Um, but the motivating factor for businesses on the Lysics framework is the market. And that's why sometimes if it leans too far in that direction, you get poor attempts at humor that end up kind of watered down and they feel like cash grabs and cheap. You go too far in the other direction. Well, the market forces are no longer at play. People might engage with the content, but that doesn't necessarily translate to sales. So it's kind of a balancing. Wholesome content tends to get shared a lot too, simply because, I mean, things are terrible. You don't have to go far on the internet to, to find things that are terrible and depressing. So when something else comes along, we latch onto it. I mean, how else do you explain the popularity of someone like Keanu Reeves, right? He's breathtaking. Why? Why was that viral? Because we have so few actual heroes in our society. We're so desperate for them. We'll create them if necessary. And that's why that betrayal, if uh, somebody turns out to not be the paragon of virtue that we held them up to be, uh, well, whose fault is that, I guess? I guess we laid it at their feet. Uh, but after all, it's us doing it in the end. All right, so high arousal emotions for virality. I think this is about where we left off. So. You've got your valence over there on the left. You've got your higher low arousal up there on the column rows. So uh, things that are positive valence that have high arousal, awe, wonder, excitement, contentment, calm, less so. When we're content or calm, uh, it's a less big emotion. We can, it, it's a state we want to be in, uh, but it's hardly one that really is very inspiring. Right. No one is uh, writing epic poetry about that day that they were super calm. It's just chill. It just doesn't happen. On the other end, negative valence emotions, anger, anxiety, disgust, very motivating, sadness and pity, less so. All right, so this is why if we mix these like so much paint, uh, we can end up with content that is um, largely positive, largely negative, or intentionally divisive, because all we're talking about here are just different combinations of emotions and dominance and so on. Uh, it completely is an intellectual exercise that removes all other context out of uh, the, the content itself, because different groups, different messages, different intentions, different reactions. But those that are high, and arousal and dominance. So those that are uh, exciting or disgusting, and then also include some kind of call to action or ability to affect agency over that and share it, of course, tend to be good things, right? They tend to be very viral. Uh, even things that have a high amount of arousal, but with low dominance, provided that they are inspiring enough, um, have more of a challenge with becoming viral, uh, but still can because we often affect agency in other ways. We have no issue with agency in terms of broadcasting messages in the days of the internet. We just take it to somewhere else, which is why content tends to be shared across multiple platforms. Like for example, uh, I don't know if anyone here would have ever heard of it, but uh, there was a site that was really popular on the internet around 99, early 2000s or so called Something Awful. And they still have forums out there. Uh, they're pretty quiet these days. Um, and for the last 10 years or so, uh, the majority of the content that you see there is simply content being taken from um, other places, Twitter usually, or um, other social media platforms. But we have the ability to share that messages and eventually everything 
will make its way over there anyway, because that's just the nature of the internet, because we're able to take those viral images and text and ideas and so on to other platforms. But if it's not arousing and there's no real uh, easy way to affect agency over sharing it, then it's unlikely to become viral. It just doesn't inspire people in that fashion. So uh, typically what we see with viral content is simplicity over complexity. Um, people will prefer simplicity over complexity, uh, which is why, <laughs> why it's so necessary to boil down even complex ideas and circumstances into fairly simple ideas. It's not, it's not a matter of comprehension. Uh, be, more like this is, I mean, this is the attention economy, right? The amount of time someone is willing to invest in understanding a message, uh, one that's particularly complex, is, uh, is just too low. If anyone's seen uh, uh, Don't Look Up with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Jennifer Lawrence, um, it was one of the problems the characters in that movie faced. They had a, a complex but terribly dire message to deliver. Uh, and yet uh, what wins out in the end is just simply the slogan, don't look up, because it's so much easier. It must be the answer. Uh, peer influence matters. This is, does everywhere else. Um, I don't need to tell anybody this, of course, anybody here. Uh, there's an entire concept of the influencer. The entire job is to use the uh, audience that they've managed to collect and uh, use it to influence people, as the name implies. Um, this leads to bandwagoning, snowball voting, brigading, raiding. There's lots of different terms for it. Really kind of depends on where you're at. Um, but even anonymous influencers, like you might find in the image boards, with the right viral message, uh, have the ability to ad hoc uh, motivate scores of people, really, who are otherwise also ostensibly anonymous uh, into piling on. That's the, uh, the entire, uh, well, was rather in the beginning, uh, the, the entire thesis to the anonymous hacker collective is that there was no central leader. Uh, everyone was ostensibly anonymous and simply everyone would, would join in on causes which they felt were worth fighting. It degraded fairly fast and while technically still around, um, most of the key players, the actual uh, cargo cult sort of charismatic leaders of the movement in the early days with the Project Scientology or Chanology, sorry, uh, and so on, uh, were eventually arrested and it led to a, a a lot of the uh, movement losing steam in the end, honestly. Um, and again, as we said before, we do a lot of the work ourselves in self-selecting content with echo chambers. Uh, we also uh, have a connected idea with this known as filter bubbles because um, obviously uh, with viral content um, or just messages in general, social media sites benefit most not from people saying the right thing on their platform or from posting the right content on their platform, but from people using their platform. And so they have an incentive both to post incendiary con uh, content, to host viral messages, even if they are otherwise disagreeable or, or even against their own best interests, as long as people are using their site to do so. And conversely, they also have a market force factor in allowing people to use their site and intentionally or unintentionally, or I should say explicitly or implicitly filter out messages they would otherwise find to be uh, distasteful. That's apropos because of course, the Twitter deal apparently has gone through finally. And we now have a uh, King Twit, oh no, sorry, Chief Twit, he called it. Elon Musk changed his profile, what's that? Yeah, Chief Musk. He actually changed his uh, title on his Twitter profile to Chief Twix, which I suppose is probably supposed to be self-referential and denigrating humor, but uh, I mean, let's be honest, it, it obviously isn't. Um, which uh, is uh, going to be really interesting for, for studying this kind of content because I don't know if you've been following any of that stuff, but uh, immediately as soon as uh, it was official, people started leaving the platform and coming back to the platform in droves. Those coming back, of course, taking the opportunity to say as many incendiary things as they possibly can in a short amount of time as they possibly can. I wonder if there's a Guinness Book of World Records for that. Um, but you know, in any event, the idea is, however, um, 
<laughs> All right, what's really funny about the, uh, the Twitter deal is I kind of have a feeling that Elon Musk only really went through with it because he realized he absolutely had to. Um, I think that he probably got in a little bit too deep, too fast, and he definitely, by waving due diligence, uh, painted himself into a corner. I thought it would be for me, of course, to, to assume or, uh, or possibly even insinuate that the richest man in the world uh, might not have done his homework on this one. Uh, but truthfully speaking, it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out because uh, it is entirely possible that Elon Musk simply didn't do his homework. And the answer is very simple. Uh, because uh, he bought something, and by buying it, it turned into a different thing. Twitter, in terms of what it does <laughs> to run the business, the actual physical processes that are, are um, at play here, are not at all novel. There's nothing in the, the uh, Twitter technology stack at all that is really worth the amount of money that, that he paid. It's the same kind of shit that anybody else could be doing on the internet. What made Twitter valuable uh, is the user base. It's the social media platform that has lots of users. It's the platform where people are talking. And so now he has this problem on his hands. We sort of legally forced to go through with this deal. And by doing so, instantaneously devalues it at the same time. It's like going out and you know buying a Tesla. As soon as you drive it off the lot, well, it's already depreciated in value. It's like every other used car, right? So what does, he, uh, what does he need to do in this case? Well, he's gonna find out that there was a reason Twitter was playing the game that they were playing, right? Twitter, just like every other social media site, every other business that's out there is dancing on the line, right? They're, they're motivated by market forces. And it seems that the insinuation is that uh, maybe, maybe the executives at Twitter, maybe they did make some missteps. I'm certainly not going to defend them any more than I'm going to defend Elon Musk. But the insinuation is that they were making decisions that weren't in the best interests of the company and instead uh, were motivated by the norms and laws and such that govern actual individual users on the internet. Simply not so. Twitter had a financial incentive to ban incendiary comments on their site. The financial incentive is that if people went to Twitter and saw those things, they noticed that people would leave Twitter, just as they left every other social media platform that didn't handle those things, which is why it seems like every social media platform from Twitter to Reddit to Instagram to everywhere suddenly clamped down on all of those things at the same time because they had an option. They aren't really under any legal requirement to handle those things. And as far as norms go, well, these social media platforms aren't people as much as some people like to um, insist that they have some moral requirement, some moral imperative to handle these kinds of things. Let's be honest, they really don't. Uh, it's not like we can hold Twitter as a collective responsible for certain things. Uh, it's market forces. The people care about the messages that they see on there. The people care about the perception of the platforms that they're using, but it's market forces, those people wanting them to stay that cause those decisions to be made. So as people are leaving, where are they gonna go? Well, as I said, Twitter's not doing anything really particularly special. I guess we'll see. Maybe people will come back. Maybe in the end, everyone really is chomping at the bit for the uh, true unfiltered thoughts of the world. God help us all. But in any event, filter bubbles are part of that process. Right? We want people to be able to create their own safe spaces. We do this uh, with administrators and moderators and so on, with rules and whatnot. And uh, if the new Twitter, as it's going to be, is going to try and move that line back to a point where all people are truly welcome on the platform, regardless of their message, then in order to make the space suitable for everybody, they're gonna be investing a lot more in moderation, which again, market forces dictate, is a lot of money to spend so that people can go on there and uh, hurl racial epithets at each other. All right, confirmation bias and manipulated prevalence is another way. Uh, that uh, information is manipulated less in a way that we do to ourselves as echo chambers and filter bubbles, but more in a way that we see done in order to um, 
make messages seem more viral uh, or more integral uh, than they, they actually are. The fake news effect, right? Confirmation bias, we expect something to happen. So we look for information that confirms those biases or we see a message appearing a lot. So of course, everyone is talking about this. I saw it on the front page of Reddit. I saw it, you know, I saw it at the top of all. I saw it at the top of all. I saw it on Twitter and so on and so forth. And um, it makes it seem like everyone is talking about it everywhere uh, when in reality, that's not necessarily the case. It's just being seen everywhere. It doesn't mean everyone is talking about it. Uh, that's what, uh, for example, here with confirmation bias and manipulated prevalence, this is happening with, uh, with Meta right now in both directions. Um, Meta as a company has been trying like hell to get their technology up off the ground, which again, in terms of social media platforms, doesn't even necessarily mean they really want to get the technology working because the technology simply isn't there. Meta is not in a position to suddenly suddenly invent the next great leap forward. It's at best a couple of years away, but they need to fund the project in the meantime. And so what they really wanna do is attract users because that's what makes social media platforms profitable. Uh, we're actually gonna talk a little bit about Meta when we actually get to this week's lecture in a few minutes. So I guess I won't get into it too much, but um, as far as their messaging goes, they've been trying like hell to get it out there to say everyone is talking about Meta, everyone is interested in it. They're paying YouTubers to make videos that are favorable for them. They're paying podcasters to do the same. Um, they're, you know, they're getting the message out there. They're trying to make it seem as if everyone is talking about this. But in reality, if we look at the usage statistics for Meta as it currently is, what we have is a couple hundred users, about a third of which are uh, crypto bros who are trying to start their own meta cryptocurrency. Confirmation bias is part of that as well. There's lots of uh, people who are releasing messages contrary to what meta's message is, going in the other direction, trying to undermine meta, not necessarily meta itself, but essentially uh, people making videos, I think like uh, Penguin Zero, I think did one uh, not that long ago, where essentially they make a video and it's like, I thought meta was trash, uh, guess what? It turns out it's trash. Huh? Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, the mere exposure effect, psychological phenomenon by which people tend to develop a preference for things merely because they are familiar with them. This is one of the reasons why uh, VR is having such a, a difficult time getting up off the ground. This is a combination of factors, to be honest with you. Number one is the cost issue because, of course, it's fairly new technologies. Basically, if you get a decent VR headset about the same as a console, uh, which by the way, console gamers, I'm sorry, but the numbers show consoles are also dying. Um, but you know, it's effectively what we're talking about. Then you need a lot of space. Uh, there's not a lot of really great titles for it right now and so on. But part of it is also the mere exposure effect. It's, it's an unfamiliar process. Uh, it's you know, part of the reason why people have trouble hopping platforms like that. Just assume that they're better because they're familiar with them. It's a, a adoptability of new technologies. Timeliness and uncorrectability. Clarifications, conspiracy busting, and fake news exposure come late when the damage is already done. Last time we talked about the Werther effect, the effect of the virality of an idea to influence behavior, not necessarily to create new behavior, uh, but to influence behaviors and thoughts that may already exist and plant that seed, allow it to germinate. Um, the Werther effect, if you forgot, was a specific case out on the West Coast near Portland where the newspaper reported on a suicide. An individual in the cab of their truck with a gas grill lit it, succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. And then oddly enough, in the weeks that followed the publication of that article, uh, four more apparent suicides using the exact same method. Police thought we have an epidemic on our hands. And as it turned out in the intervening weeks, uh, the paper issued a correction. It turned out that the story that they had initially published was almost completely false in every way. Uh, it was an accidental death. It was in a garage, not in the cab of a truck and so on. But of course, by the time that publication had come out, number one, have you ever seen a newspaper printer retraction? Buried on page five at the very bottom. 
We regret that an article in one of our recent issues was incorrect. Turns out that the president is not collecting ducks. You know, nobody ever reads that stuff. So the damage is already done. People don't notice the correction. It's timeliness and uncorrectability. Once an idea gets out, you can't put it back in, right? Once Pandora opens the box, everything's out. Nothing's coming back. So these uh, viralities, these interactions in the Lysig framework between social norms, expectations, and marketability, uh, they can conflate at times uh, into horrifying phenomena uh, such as the uh, YouTube face phenomena. So YouTube, popular video sharing platform, I'm sure everyone's familiar with it. Uh, you get a, a good amount of statistics on your video, an amazing amount of statistics. It's really cool, as a matter of fact. Um, you know, I'm a nerd, so whatever. Uh, but if you look at the specific performance of, of various videos, you can even do A-B testing with videos and determine which thumbnails specifically tend to generate the most views and the most watch time and so on and so forth. Well, uh, their algorithm, which they implemented as a way of, of course, increasing their own market share, keeping people on their platform, but also connecting users with content that they are potentially interested in. Well, they keep track of that information too, so that they know what videos to recommend. Well, over time, uh, this settled into a state uh, where essentially creators and the platform alike became aware of the fact that uh, certain thumbnails tended to draw the eye more, tended to cause people to click. And so we have the YouTube face phenomena, as it's known, where the thumbnails with the mad faces and the bright colors and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, this looks, uh, you ever go to a preschool and just kind of look in? I mean, this looks like Saturday morning cartoon stuff, right? Bright colors, cartoons, crazy faces. Maybe we're all preschoolers in some fashion. Well, that's because, uh, again, it's a combination of factors. Uh, the best way in my mind to think of it is uh, it's kind of like games. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to talk about games. But it's kind of like games where the developer has an idea, all right? They spend a lot of time making it. And in addition to creating the premise for the game and the art and doing all of the work. They also create a set of rules. But once a game is in the hands of a player, it's the players that make the game. It all works kind of the same way, right? YouTube makes a platform. They create an algorithm for specific purposes. But once it's out there in the public and the public starts using it, it becomes the public's platform. And how they use it affects how it grows, how it develops. There are some people who will use a platform like that, and they'll game it, right? They'll figure out how it works. They'll do things specifically to get certain reactions and so on. Um, and sometimes the platforms need to change in order to prevent certain damaging behaviors. And the reason for that is because, again, while we have individual players and individuals can be complicated and unpredictable, if we take it in aggregate, again, not the case. Social media activities, by and large, can be predicted and they can be influenced. We can determine preferences. We can provide content that speaks to specific users, get specific reactions, just the same as specific users can do the same with the platform. This has been shown many a time. As a matter of fact, uh, I believe I've talked about this one before, but the bottom one here, Kotika Lupudi et al. 2012, a study done, University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota gave access to these researchers, their net flow data, uh, and also allowed them to conduct psychological testing on campus, following specific users on their internet traffic without their knowledge prior, or following, taking a, an MMPI, a psychological personality. And connecting the users who they knew had certain personality traits and examining their behavior, uh, they found that users who were depressed tended to operate computers differently. They browsed differently. The bounce rate was higher. They didn't spend as much time on a page. They rarely sc uh, scrolled down below the fold. They didn't go to any interior pages. If they were looking for information, they would hop back and forth. 
I can tell you from our NetFlow data on this campus uh, that we can always tell, for example, when it's midterms week or when it's finals week, all you people go crazy. <laughs> You're all stressed the hell out. <laughs> Understandable. But it does change the, uh, the information that we have. It changes the information we get, I should say. Uh, and then in some cases, it changes the way that we respond. Right? We'll prioritize certain matters during those times. It's not the only uh, example here. Uh, Matt's et al. 2017 conducted a uh, similar test, or I should say a test in the same vein, uh, to determine if there were any particular characteristics of technology use that could perhaps be used to predict uh, certain incidents, certain crimes, for example, mass shootings uh, or uh, domestic um, altercations. And uh, as a result of Matt's et al., um, it is a, a matter that's being taken quite seriously. The FBI has um, a profile of technology use concerning behaviors that one might observe online for individuals prior to um, doing something like this. We call them pre-incident indicators or PINs. And uh, it's not the only one. There's plenty of them out there. As a matter of fact, uh, this is not something that's necessarily new specifically with technology, although it has grown with it. But pre-incident indicators are such a reliable indicator of future behavior. And uh, some of you out there might be terrified at this point because we are talking about future crime here. Nobody's talking about going out and arresting somebody because of what they post online. It's, that's not what we're talking about. We are talking about some manner of intervention, but we're not talking about arresting people because they're having thoughts or something like that. Um, it's more along the lines of how seriously should we take it. So these pre-incident indicators, uh, for example, are used all the time in criminology uh, and all the time in executive protection services to determine whether or not certain behaviors are indicative of an actual threat on a principal or uh, maybe more of somebody venting or, or something along those lines. Uh, it actually comes from a, a study, a uh, gentleman, uh, Gavin DeBecker, uh, conducted um, beginning with the incident indicators noticed by victims of crimes. And so what he did <clears throat> is he went out and he interviewed some 10,000 victims of crime and uh, asked them about what happened to them and how they were, what they were feeling, what the, what the perpetrator said and so on. Um, and uh, in every case identified, at least for the victims, certain warning signs, pre-incident indicators of their imminent victimization. And uh, he found a lot of similarities in the 10,000 case studies that he examined. So for example, you know, people were uh, overly friendly, you know, um, insisting on being helpful, even if they said no multiple times, um, being overly um, open, sharing secrets, talking, too much, being very friendly, the kind of friendly that you know, makes the hair stand up on your neck, that gives you the willies. Uh, and that is actually the, uh, the exact lesson that DeBecker learned is that in most of these cases, the 10,000 victims that he spoke with, uh, they often said the same thing. I should have known. I had a bad feeling. I should have known something was going to happen. Not that they necessarily blamed themselves because it's obviously something that victims do that they ought not feel, but uh, the idea that they had no previous knowledge or no way of acknowledging the fact that they were uh, imminent victimization was oncoming uh, was not necessarily the case. It's just that socially speaking, we're often conditioned to suppress those kinds of things, those bad feelings, uh, to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, to um, assume that it's us, not them, that you're being paranoid or whatever. And this is actually compiled into a, a book by Gavin DeBecker known as The Gift of Fear. And if you've ever been interested in that kind of thing, I definitely recommend it. But that's basically what it comes down to. That fear is a gift uh, and that you should listen to your gut. Just as in these cases, while we're not talking about predicting future crimes or arresting anyone, um, if we can quantify, if we can quantify human behavior, and if we use psychological targeting for things like selling toothpaste or voting a certain way uh, or joining a certain platform, then maybe we also ought to use it for things like reducing suffering in our society. All right, this brings us to the concept of the big five. I'm sure almost everybody here has at least at one point uh, heard of the Myers-Briggs personality inventory, the 
uh, Sweet 16, as they call it. Um, but uh, we're actually not talking about that anymore. It's not something that's very often used in social sciences. Uh, what has replaced that is known as the big five. It's not really a personality inventory so much as like the dark tetrad, it's just personality indicators. They call it the big five because there are five factors in it. It's also known by the acronym OCEAN because the different factors are O, openness, <clears throat> C, conscientiousness, E, extroversion, A, agreeableness, and N, neuroticism. Sometimes these will go by different names, but the acronym OCEAN is nice and clean, and so that's what I go with, but you can find them different names all the time. Now, the reason we're going to talk about the big five isn't because we're going to go into detail on it, but because personality traits are predictable in computer systems and used all the time, well, can we use them for other things? Or where might we see these factors show up in usage of a computer system? So um, the big five, those personality traits essentially exist on a continuum. Some people are more of one thing. Some people are more of another. It's kind of a mixture, unlike the whole IT, INTJ thing or the INFJ thing or uh, all of that stuff with the Myers-Briggs. It's uh, less about putting people into different categories, and more about simply quantifying their, uh, their personality and their behaviors in a certain way. So for example, um, well, before I go that far. So for example, we might see that uh, people who are higher on a scale of extroversion uh, in real life, they might be more talkative, more energetic and so on. While online, they might be more talkative too. They might seek out social experiences. Um, somebody who is agreeable, we might see a correspondence with that individual with another one uh, where they're, they're more sympathetic to them. They wanna, they ask more questions about the other person. They want to learn about them. If they're having a bad day, they might extend uh, their sympathy towards them and so on. People who are conscientious or high in conscientiousness, I should say, uh, that behavior might come out in um, organizing more things. Um, they have a to-do, they have their action items listed. You might see that in an Outlook uh, calendar or something like that. Uh, we might see plans for things in a computer system. Neuroticism is an easy one. You find that all over the place online. Also called emotional stability. People who are tense, moody, and anxious, and who isn't these days, but still. Um, you see that all, all the time online. I'm not even going to get into that one because it's pretty obvious. Uh, openness is what you might see in uh, people online who uh, are interested in other technologies, willing to try new platforms, insisting on playing different games, or so on and so forth. Now, this is not exclusive with the dark chat thread because uh, the big five personality inventory can be does not capture malevolent traits. And it's possible to have a personality of certain quantifiable traits and still have dark tetrad traits in addition to that. So for example, somebody who happens to possess the trait of narcissism and they tend to be high in neuroticism and extroversion, well, you can bet that they're going to go out and they're gonna seek people online. Uh, and because of the dark tetrad trait that they possess, uh, most likely use them in some fashion or another, some way to get attention. Um, as a matter of fact, narcissists who are extroverted and neurotic tend to be the most destructive online. They're the ones who use social media as a, a way to gain access to uh, endless pools of, of victims. Although, of course, they probably don't perceive them as victims because they're narcissists. So, of course, they don't do anything bad. Uh, so you can have an agreeable psychopath, sociopath, narcissist, and so on. They're not mutually exclusive. All right, so this brings us to concept again of persona ex machina as we talked about quite a while ago, and it has been a while. So if you've forgotten uh, what that means, what we're talking about are personality traits that go into self-representation online, a behavioral schema of the user of the system, how they behave and the artifacts that they leave behind. The artifacts they leave behind in the system are gonna be informed by their personality and might be molded by their impulses in, well, in any sense, I suppose, but in particular, uh, those that would go beyond merely what is required to achieve certain goals within a system and go out of their way to actually perhaps damage others. 
So essentially the way that a person presents themselves online is one of the most personal choices that they're gonna make. And I know everyone here has probably picked a profile picture a thousand times. Uh, chances are you use the same one over and over again, uh, or you just use the default one. And you, know, you might not think it says very much about you. And at the end of the day, does it tell somebody what your entire personality is? No, of, of course it doesn't. Uh, it's not the most important thing that you have ever, the, the most important choice you've ever made. But it is still a choice. And that is revealing of at least a couple of things. And as studies have shown for some people, even if it's not you that this describes, but for some people, personal choices like that are tantamount to extremely revealing choices. So how they choose to represent themselves online really matters. Things like in the image that you selected, perhaps, uh, you didn't even consciously think of at the time. But if it's a picture of you, the facial expression that you have, uh, if it's not of you, then the color palette, the actual representation, the lighting, and so on. Uh, essentially, if you're picking a picture, you're picking things that appeal to you in some fashion. A monkey, right? Uh, so the results are here of that study, but I'll show you actual examples here in just a moment. Um, but essentially, uh, if you see certain categories here in red, it means that it's a negative correlation, in green, a positive correlation. Some of them more possible or more positive than others, for example in terms of uh, gender, a positive correlation there with extroversion and agreeability in terms of profile selection, <clears throat> smiling, uh, anger, disgust, and so on. <clears throat> um, the emotions that are being displayed in the profile picture uh, matter a great deal depending on exactly who we're talking about here in terms of their big five personality. So this is what it actually boils down to. It's a lot easier to see in this fashion, however, uh, if we take a 10,000 foot view like this, it's kind of hard to see, right? <clears throat> if you take a moment to see over there on the left, uh, high levels of extroversion over here, low levels of extroversion over there, lots more pictures with multiple people, lots more pictures of people smiling over here, mostly pictures of in single individuals, uh, either neutral facial expressions or so on. But again, looking at it like this, especially from this far away over a projector, uh, really hard to figure out. So. Take an even closer look. <clears throat> so what that study shows, first of all, uh, those high in openness uh, tend to have profile pics other than faces, revealing a non-conformance to expectations, more likely to have a grayscale or monotone appearance, conscientiousness, conforming to what's expected generally of a profile picture, um, but generally a single subject, positive facial expression rather than neutral. Although let's not get crazy with it. We're talking about people who are conscientious, not extroverted. So we don't want to send the message that, uh, you know, we're at the middle of a party or something like that. Uh, they're going to be usually lower quality pictures. We find that most often they're going to be out of focus or blurry or candid photos taken by somebody else more than anything else. So it will be a deliberate photo, something that definitely conforms to the expectations of a profile pic will be entirely utilitarian in nature. Oh, which by the way, uh, in most of my personal accounts, uh, I almost never actually use a picture, usually it'd be something like this. However, intentionally picked uh, for my uh, staff photo here in Teams, something like this, to lure people into a false sense of security that I'm conscientious, but that I can hit them with how terrible I am. Lowered expectations, take advantage. High and extroversion. These are gonna be pictures generally people will be picking. Extroverts are people who like people. They're gonna be around people all the time. And so you're gonna have those just out of the choices that are available, there's gonna be more photos to choose from of being around people as you see here on the left. Or uh, we'll go with the extremely polished picture, right? No blurry photos here. Gotta be something that puts your best foot forward something that's the best possible representation of yourself and so on, because they are aware of how it reflects upon them. Tend to have more color to them, the most colorful of all the pictures with extroverts. Those who are high in agreeableness, still color photos, 
uh, but they, uh, they tend to almost be exclusively candid pictures, something that was taken very quick. They still tend to conform to what's expected of a profile picture, i.e. showing the person uh, themselves. Um, lots of blurry photos here, most likely completely untouched or, or completely unstaged, just kind of randomly taken at one point. Uh, but also with agreeableness, they also tend to be personal pictures, uh, ones that they themselves really enjoy and identify with, something, them doing something that they really like to do. I've, uh, I've written ideographic digital profiles for, for subjects um, with their uh, profile pictures here as an item inside um, and identifying the activity that they're, they're taking part in here almost always comes up multiple times in the investigation because you're going to find evidence that, you know, for example, they enjoy hiking or something like that. Um, but with people who are high in agreeableness, as far as the big five factors go, uh, is also a great way of breaking the ice with them in a potential interrogation, right? Just go in there and uh, you don't even have to say anything. Get yourself some, uh, some hiking boots, scuff them up, just sit in there, maybe drop some hints. We'll start a conversation. And lastly, the N in ocean neuroticism. Here we see more monotone photographs. They tend to not be grayscale, but they do tend to be fairly muted in their color palettes. Um, so not grayscale, but uncolorful, I guess we could say. Uh, they also tend to not show their faces, just as uh, the uh, openness peoples tend to do. Um, if they do take a picture, Faces are usually covered up somewhat. Definitely not taking their glasses off for that kind of a thing. Uh, also, the uh, amount of the picture that's taken up by uh, the face will be almost like this weird Dutch angle this, this girl has ended up with here. Uh, very odd proportions in terms of uh, face to picture ratio here. Now, again, uh, nobody is all uh, of one of these things. We're, we're all a mixture of all of them. And uh, that mixture is in flux constantly, right? There is no way to quantify your personality regardless of any other circumstances. It's all a schema and it all depends on what's going on, the kind of day you're having and so on. But over time, again, on a long enough scale, uh, things do tend to even out. We tend to have somewhat more of some than others but it's a mixture. Now we also can't ignore the uh, elephant in the room here, which is that uh, profile pics, again, as I mentioned before, are a deliberate choice, but they aren't necessarily considered to be a very important choice. And almost every platform is going to have the default avatar. And boy, doesn't that throw us all off, throws us all for a loop with the default avatar. But uh, that too is a choice. And uh, it is non-conforming to stick with the default avatar, right? And they can, as users of social media platforms, such as these, note, uh, you are sending a message. You are saying something by not saying something. You're also saying something um, by self-selecting the anime avatar. You might, <laughs> you might say, I know, I'll throw, I'll throw all the researchers for a loop. I have an anime avatar, but you are saying something with a choice like that as well. <clears throat> or as this uh, user of Twitter noted, 40% chance of, I'm sorry, 73% chance of sexism if the avatar is an anime character. Or the Sonic says. <laughs> or as this gentleman says. <laughs> Now, uh, I don't want to, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to call the, the, the previous commenter on Twitter into question here, but uh, I will note, however, uh, that this person with an anime avatar is going by the moniker, A. Wyatt Man, which if you're not familiar with uh, white supremacist imagery, rhetoric, and iconography, uh, it's a really difficult code to crack. It's been used on comics uh, for white supremacists for years, A. White Man. Uh, and of course, the handle at white man 88, 88 for HH, the eighth letter of the alphabet for Heil Hitler. Stop being a pussy and fight for culture, fight our cultural degeneration, says guy with an anime avatar with dog whistle 
uh, white supremacist uh, symbology here as well. All right, so <clears throat> essentially, uh, this phenomenon uh, behaving differently around friends and family, well known, right? We all are, uh, talked earlier this semester about code switching and so on. And uh, we tend to be more ourselves when we are away from the consequences of our actions. Not necessarily that so much. Uh, as we're going to talk about when we get to talking about video games and, uh, sorry, uh, later this week, um, we also have the opportunity in a virtual space uh, to essentially be idealized versions of ourselves, right? We don't have to take that baggage all along with us. But for many of us, when given the chance to be whatever we want, we can choose the worst part of us. For some of us, the best part of us, and somehow kind of all evens out in the end. But our behaviors, they follow us around. We are still who we are. Very few of us adopt completely novel identities online. To the point, where even if we are, for example, uh, crunching the numbers here on uh, social media, uh, music sharing platforms like Spotify, um, we can take a look at that information, we can extrapolate it, we can quantify it, and determine with fair amounts of accuracy, thanks to data analytics in the era of big data, which we'll talk about week after next, or next, I can't remember if next week, in any, any event, uh, crunch those numbers and determine not only demographic information, right? I mean, it, you don't have to be a data scientist here uh, to see somebody here has been uh, streaming T-Swift nonstop for, for four years uh, to get a pretty good handle on the kind of person that probably is. But there's more to them than that, than just their age and gender and so on. There's a whole host of information that we could potentially determine, including their very personality and what makes them them the number of Facebook friends they probably have, how satisfied they are with their life. Turns out most people are not very satisfied with their life, which, which is why it's so effective to sell people on products that will promise to make it better, take the edge off. All right, we're at three o'clock. We will talk about video games next time. Take care. Uh, yeah, I know, but I got I to gotta run in the... Uh, and get my kids here. So.